Well, good morning everybody and welcome to our service of worship for Haywood Baptist Church. You'll notice that I'm coming uh, to you this morning from a slightly different location. I'm house sitting and so I'm sat in a lovely kitchen at the moment and it's been lovely weather this week, hasn't it? So, um, so I don't know whether sitting in the kitchen will make me more animated and passionate or not. But all that I want to say to all who are joining online today is that you are welcome in this space. That there are no outsiders to the grace of God. And so therefore I pray that you will taste and see that the Lord is good. As we join together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, to learn more of scripture, to pray for others. Um, just every week it is a wonderful privilege to come to you. And um, today we're still on Jeremiah. Oh gosh, last two weeks have been, you know, slightly... Uh, Challenging to say the least, and I think we've got another challenging message uh, coming your way this morning. So let's, as uh, we prepare to engage in worship together, let's just quiet our hearts and I will pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that there are no outsiders to your love, that your grace is unbounding, it is full and it is free and available to all in Jesus Christ. We bring our hearts this morning, O oh God, before you, praying and saying, we are here, Holy Spirit. We are here with open hearts, open hands to be moulded, to be pliable, to be soft, to be ready for change. For God, we want to learn of the way of Jesus. We want to digest the way of Jesus and we want to live out the way of Jesus in our world. And because we know we often get it wrong, God, because no, we know we often get some things right, but other things wrong. We do come firstly to ask for your forgiveness. And in the acknowledgement of our weakness, we also therefore ask for strength. Strength to hear and to see and perceive this morning. That we might, in this receiving posture, be able to go out in peace to love and serve the Lord in our world. Gracious God, therefore, be with us in our journey of worship because we declare our openness and availability to you, asking for your gracious response in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to join uh, Clive now, who is going to lead our song aspect of worship. Savior God to thee 
How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I Sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art! How great thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God His Son not sparing sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art.
In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, they will each turn from their wicked ways. Then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. So Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Baruch wrote them on the scroll. Then Jeremiah told Baruch, I am restricted. I am not allowed to go to the Lord's temple. So you go to the house of the Lord on a day of fasting and read to the people from the scroll the words of the Lord that, I, that you wrote as I dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who come in from their towns. Perhaps they will bring their petition before the Lord and will each turn from their wicked ways for the anger and wrath pronounced against this people by the Lord are great. Baruch, son of Neriah, did everything Jeremiah the prophet told him to do. At the Lord's temple, he read the words of the Lord from the scroll. The king sent Jehudai to get the scroll, and Jehudai brought it from the room of Elishama, the secretary, and read it to the king and all the officials standing beside him. It was the ninth month, and the king was sitting in the winter apartment with a fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. 
Whenever Jehudai had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with a scribe's knife and threw them into the firepot until the entire scroll was burned in the fire. After the king burned the scroll containing the words that Baruch had written at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write on it all the words that were on the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, burned up. Also tell Jehoiakim, king of Judah, this is what the Lord says. You burned that scroll and said, Why did you write on it that the king of Babylon would certainly come and destroy this land and wipe it from both man and beast? Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He will have no one to sit on the throne of David. His body will be thrown out and exposed to the heat by day and the frost by night. I will punish him and his children and his attendants for their wickedness. I will bring on them and those living in Jerusalem and the people of Judah every disaster I pronounced against them, because they have not listened. Amen. We find Jeremiah this morning in a very difficult position. And I want us to um, try and unpack uh, together uh, what this story might be trying to say to us. We've got Jeremiah and he writes words of prophecy on a scroll and he gives them to maybe his uh, administrator or his writer to go and read in the temple. So I think I've got like six particular points that we can hang our thoughts on this morning. I want to look at the excluded, the ally, prophecy, resistance, resurrection and judgment. So let's begin. We find Jeremiah this morning. In this story, a man who is excluded. His, pre his presence and his voice is no longer welcome in the temple of the Lord and therefore he has been forbidden to enter. He is now the voice on the margin, the prophetic lone voice. And so his only recourse is to use his ally Baruch. He will be the one who writes the words of prophecy that are not welcome in the temple. And he will be the one as an ally to Jeremiah who will stand in solidarity with him to give the word of the Lord in his stead. Jeremiah, the excluded one. His presence, his voice is not welcome anymore amongst the people and Baruch becomes his ally the one who stands in solidarity with him listening to Jeremiah on the margins then taking his words into the center into the place of God's people Now, Jeremiah is command, commanded to write down all the words of prophecy that are to be read to the people. Baruch is charged to go and read this prophecy out. And so God's word is given in the temple. Now, one of the things we need to emphasise when it comes to these words of prophecy is they are not being written in a sort of doom and gloom way. There is still within the words of prophecy that are to be delivered the hope of mercy for God's very own people. The words are not being read in a sense to... Say there is no hope, 
but rather God, again, like we saw last week, is pleading with the people and almost saying, if I can only mirror the people's behaviour to them through prophecy, maybe they will reflect and maybe they will choose to amend their ways and become merciful again and give heed to God's word. God never gives his word just purely to belittle and put people down. That can be the end result of the ignorance of people. But God always gives his word with a heart of mercy. With a note of possible return and blessing. And yet as soon as these words of prophecy are read in the temple, we encounter resistance. The king calls for the scroll. Those in power ask to listen to the word. And as the words of the scroll are read out, the king slices them up and throws them into the fire in the most dismissive way, in the most proud and haughty fashion. He rejects and, and the people of Israel reject by virtue of this, the word of the Lord. Power will always cling to power. And Jeremiah's words written on this scroll are words that challenge power and challenge privilege. And power clings to power. And power resists and dismisses the words of God himself. And yet, even in that resistance, word comes again to Jeremiah. Write it all down once more. And I don't know whether Jeremiah writes the exact words that he'd written before. And I tend to think maybe that's what happened. Because I think my word resurrection here is to display that God's word and way in this world, never die. Despite what resistance evil brings to the light of God's truth and word, his word still stands. For the word of the Lord endures forever. There is a resurrection of God's word, despite its burial and its, its dismissal at the hands of those who wear injustice as a badge of pride. Ha! God's way never dies. People have said to me, my um, emphasis on inclusion will mean that the church will die. Well, I've got news for everybody. Jesus said, I will build my church. <laughs> and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The very fires in which people dismiss the word of God will, will not dampen the ways of God and the ways of his kingdom in this world. God always is in the game of resurrection, my friends, and he resurrects his word in this story. And yet... Now, this resurrection really seals judgment. The sad thing is, the people who cling to power, evil and injustice, in the rewriting and the rereading of this and these words, are indeed now being given judgment that is the only thing that will come to pass 
God will execute judgment. And yet the words that are written will still remain so that the generations after this judgment will read and understand how they themselves might enter into blessing if they would but receive the word that was rejected by their king who in his rejection gets nobody on the throne from his line. The excluded, the ally, prophecy, resistance, resurrection, judgment. What does that say to us today? So let's just take some themes. It struck me uh, last week in our face-to-face -face service, we looked at the stats of the uh, poorer countries when it comes to COVID, cases of death, um, the vaccination programme. And it spoke to me that actually at the moment we could say in this time of COVID, the excluded, those on the margins like Jeremiah is in this story, are the poor. The poor are excluded from the vaccine. They're excluded from education. They are not aware due to their poverty. And so this calls for an ally. Who is going to be the prophetic voice that takes the word of the Lord into the heart of the corridors of power to champion justice and inclusion on a global scale? That, my friends, is the role of the church. We are like the Baruch. We are like the one who takes the cries of injustice from the margins into the corridors of power. And though our words might seem to those who cling to power as judgment, um, as a call on their privilege, yet our words have to be given with mercy with the possibility of blessing where mercy is shown, of restoration where the word is heeded and repentance and reflection take place. And yet just as there was resistance to the words of Jeremiah from those in power, we can face resistance in our prophetic call in this world. We can be seen as being too nice to everybody, as pulling all the boundaries down that we've built up over the years. But our task is to expose to those around us the attitude of who is first? Us, who have privilege and power and status, or the powerless? Are we going to cry out in prayer, in protest for those who have no voice and we have to be careful because in a sense if we refuse to fulfill our prophetic mandate we align ourselves with those in privilege and power against those that God is for but we need to understand that if we choose to deliver the word of the Lord, as Je Jeremiah does it, and as B Baruch, as the ally, partners with him, that even if there is resistance, God's way will not die. We are never to be discouraged, my friends, from walking in the way of Jesus, even though we may be a minority voice. It does not mean that our voice will not be heeded in the future, though it is rejected in the now. God will always see to it that his way is magnified in this world. Magnified in the unusual places. Maybe people will heed our words that are not in the temple, that are not in the chosen community. And God has a handy habit of going out of the bounds of what we think is his way. His kingdom has no real boundary points. 
God has a habit of raising up peoples and nations who will do his will. That don't necessarily belong to us. And so we can stand in a sense knowing that God will always stand by those that stand by his word. That are allies to the poor. But oh we have to. We have to. Sometimes sound the words of judgment. God can set his face against us. If we refuse to align ourselves with the cries of the oppressed. And in our silence we align ourselves to those in privilege and power. Who wear the badge of injustice with pride. God can set his face against us. Rich nations and powerful nations may be humbled. We don't know. Let's just unpack another issue. Asylum seekers. Many view asylum seekers with suspicion. They don't really want to welcome them. The Home Office consistently makes it difficult for those claiming asylum on legitimate grounds. And so again, we as the people of God are mandated to use our voice prophetically. To say that our God welcomes the stranger, welcomes the outcast. And our God says to us, remember that you was once a stranger and an outcast to me. Therefore, don't withhold mercy from the other. We are their voices. And in a way, glory to God that in Hayward Baptist Church, our voice is being heard in this arena. For we have chosen like Baruch to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters who are on the margins. And though we sound a note of righteous anger against the injustice of the system. We believe that as we show mercy and welcome. That blessing will come. That as words of prophecy are heeded from our very own scriptures and given to the world around us and lived out in the world around us. That God can still have mercy and bring blessing to our nation through its welcome of the other. And yet we do face resistance, sometimes resistance from within and resistance from without to this mandate that we've been given at Haywood Baptist Church and a mandate given for all that claim the name of Jesus. And yet, as we've seen, God always wins out in the end. So though our voice is dismissed, though we are seen as soft touches, yet God will bring forth justice in this world if we will but be resilient. And know that though those in power would tear our words asunder and throw them away, yet they will ultimately get heard. And again, we have to sound a note of judgment. If we fail to show mercy, God will withhold mercy from us. And there's all kinds of other arenas where we are called as the prophetic people of God. To be with the outsider. Now we all struggle with politics and agendas and the gospel. But is there not a cry from Black Lives Matter. That is telling us as a church. To reflect, repent and pick up a prophetic mantle. When it comes to inclusion of racists. Is it not the same when when it comes to the murder of Sarah Everard? We've been forced 
again as a nation to reflect why many women don't feel safe. So the church picks up the prophetic mandate of full inclusion regardless of gender. And we can move this even further and look at the LGBTQIA plus community. Those on the margins who have been abused by conversion therapy. And we can ask ourselves, do we have a prophetic call and duty to speak out against this practice? And in any of the things that we've talked about, unfortunately, our silence makes us complicit with those who are in power and hold privilege. And who use that power and privilege to exclude. We are called. Now we might not be the ally. We might be the very excluded ones like Jeremiah. And so if, we, if you feel like a Jeremiah today. Know that in any of the areas. The church of Jesus Christ is your partner we stand in solidarity with you if you have been abused if you have been excluded on the grounds of your religion your race your culture your gender we are here and we want to partner with you to hear your words so that we might be a prophetic voice a prophetic voice that honours the diversity and richness of this world and mirrors the grace of God and says you are in. God is a merciful God. And whether we're excluded or whether we're the ally, the prophetic word is God is for you. God is wanting to challenge those who have held the power and the abuse to let go of that, that we might live in a safer world and we might be a safer faith community for all. Yes, there may be resistance within the church and without the church. Yet we are called prophetically to understand that though those who wear injustice as a badge of pride would tear up our words and put them in the fire God will stand by the voice of those who cry out for those who are on the underside of history. Let us pick up our mantle, O oh people of God, to either find the Jeremiahs and hear them. And then as we hear them, to pick up those words and mirror them to the society we live in, in the full knowledge that though judgment may come, yet our words and our voice sets us against power. But on the side of a God of justice who cries out from Jeremiah and from his words for this world and us too. To amend our ways. God will ultimately have the last say. He will execute judgment against the powerless. Against the powerful, sorry. And he will raise up the powerless to feast on his kingdom. So let us be the prophetic voice. That is needed in our world today. Amen. Let's just close our eyes and silently reflect. Lord, may your word have its way in our hearts. Amen.
morning everybody. In our prayers for others today, we pray for those daring to speak out like Jeremiah, regardless of criticism and at a significant risk of persecution. We pray for those like Greta Thunberg, who are pressuring world leaders and organisations to honour commitments and make lasting changes for the benefit of our world and future generations. We pray that their speaking out will be a catalyst for ever greater levels of change from individuals, communities, corporations and world bodies alike. We pray for those campaigning against injustice and inequality, like the Black Lives Matter campaign, that their campaigning will rebalance society and bring about a fairer world for all. We pray for those demonstrating peacefully against loss of freedoms, like many of the citizens of Hong Kong. We pray that China will respect their people. We are blessed by the offer of asylum from the UK for those who feel they can't accept such a regime. We pray for the citizens of Myanmar, suffering under an unelected military dictatorship. We pray that their peaceful protests may bring about significant change and a return to democracy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those countries where dialogue has failed and war has resulted. Today we pray specifically for the Middle East where many are suffering. We pray for Israel and Palestine that peace negotiations will succeed and that neighbours can once again live peacefully together. We pray for Syria and an end to the long-running civil war that is tearing the country apart. We pray for neighbouring countries supporting so many refugees from the fighting. We pray that peacemakers can bring the factions together to broker peace in these days. We pray for Saudi Arabia and Iran fighting proxy wars in countries like the Yemen and Iraq, exerting power yet seemingly unaware of the plight of the people. We pray that these religious governments would be confronted by a God of love bringing about transformation and new life in their lands and among their peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And finally, we pray for those without a voice. We pray for the Uyghur people in China, an oppressed minority seemingly being made to conform Issues are complex, but we pray that these people will be allowed to live without coercion, that China can accept diversity and allow peaceful expression of a different culture. We pray for displaced people who seek refuge in other countries. We pray that refugees and asylum seekers will be treated humanely. We pray that their claims will be handled fairly and without undue delay, so that they can once again settle and contribute to the good of their new home countries. We pray for the refugees and asylum seekers that we may know, and in this Refugee Week, that we might, through simple acts, re-establish contacts lost during the pandemic. We pray for those in our community who may be frail or infirm. We pray that we will look out for and support them in their day-to-day -day lives. We pray particularly for those who have lost confidence during the pandemic or may have had to rehabilitate in care homes. Guide us in the best way we can support and show to love to those without a voice, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen.
So thank you for joining us. Our mandate now is to go as bearers of God's word in speech and in action to show the kingdom of God that has been fully released in and through Jesus Christ to our world. May God's grace and mercy be with us and may we find the ready assistance of the Holy Spirit in our prophetic task in this world. Let us say together in closing the words that we long to have wrapped around us for this coming week, the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and ever more. Amen. God bless you all and go in peace. to see you soon.